Rebecca, thank you for that special. Um, Today is uh, the last sermon that we'll be seeing from the Gospel of Luke. We actually started the series of Luke back on the last Sunday of August 2018. So 90 sermons later, and we are in 2021. So if you would, turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, the last three verses of Luke this morning. Um, The title of this morning's sermon is The Ascension and Its Implications. Luke 24, 50 is where we'll start. When uh, Charles Coulson, one time, one time Watergate criminal turned founder of Prison Fellowship Ministries, when he's challenged about the truth of Christ's resurrection, he responds in this way. He says, My answer is always that the disciples and 500 others gave witness, eyewitness accounts of seeing Jesus raised from the tomb. But then I'm asked, How do you know they weren't telling the, the truth? How do you know they were telling the truth? How do you know they weren't perpetuating a hoax? Colson says, my answer to that comes from an unlikely source, Watergate. He writes, Watergate involved a conspiracy perpetuated by the closest aides to the President of the United States, the most powerful men in America, who were intensely loyal to their president, President Nixon. But one of them, John Dean, turned state's evidence. That is, he testified against Nixon, as he put it, to save his own skin. And he did so only two weeks after informing the president about what was really going on. The cover-up or the lie could only be held together for two weeks. And then everybody else jumped ship to save themselves. Now all those around the president were facing... Now all those around the presidents were facing was embarrassment. Maybe even prison, but nobody's life was at stake. But what about the disciples? Twelve powerless men peasants really, were facing not just embarrassment or political disgrace, but beatings, stoning, and execution. Every one of the disciples, instead of insisted to their dying breaths that they had physically seen Jesus bodily raised from the dead. Don't you think that one of those apostles would have cracked before being beheaded or stoned? That one of them would have made a deal with the authorities? None of them did. Men will give their lives for something they believe to be true. They will never give their lives for something they know to be false. The Watergate cover-up reveals the true nature of humanity. Even political zealots at the pinnacle of power will, in the crunch, save their own necks, even at the expense of the ones they profess to serve so loyally. But the apostles could not deny Jesus because they had seen him face to face and they knew he had risen from the dead. No, you can't take it from an expert in cover-ups. I've lived through Watergate, that nothing less than a resurrected Christ could have caused those men to maintain to their dying whispers that Jesus is alive and is Lord. 2,000 years later, nothing less than the power of the risen Christ could inspire Christians around the world to remain faithful despite prison, torture, and even death. Jesus is Lord. That's the thrilling message of Easter and the resurrection. It's a historic fact, one convincingly established by the evidence, and one you can bet your life upon. That's Charles Coulson in his Breakpoint commentary. So here we are at the end of Luke after 90 sermons. The disciples here, they need to be convinced that what they were seeing was a real person, that it was really Jesus. And to have their fears at this point at this supernatural manifestation, to have their fears calmed. Was it really him? So Jesus, therefore, showed them his physical body of flesh and bones. Touch me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like me. He showed them his hands and feet with all the nail prints in them. And to go further with proof, to show the reality of his presence, he ate food while in their presence. And then after this, he would allow them to see his ascension. After 40 days of being with him after the resurrection, they would allow to, he would allow to, them to see him rise, to ascend. And so we're going to look at the ascension and the implications of the ascension. To ascend means to be elevated, to rise, both physically as well as in status or position. And so we'll see that. Let's look at Luke 24, verse 50 to 53. 
the last three verses of Luke. It says, and he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So we have here a picture, a literal description of the ascension of Jesus, though in the scripture reading, Acts 11, or Acts 111, it was a little bit more detailed. But here we have the ascension of Jesus at this place near Bethany. Bethany, if you remember, is a suburb, rubs right up next to Jerusalem, the city itself. So here, the ascension of Christ takes place 40 days after the resurrection in the town of Bethany. He took his disciples there on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. It was just outside of Jerusalem, again, a suburb. He lifted up his hands, he blessed them, and while doing so, he's taken up into heaven. In fact, Acts 1, as was read this morning, says that he was received up into the cloud and taken up into heaven. So he lifted up his hands, blessed them, was taken into heaven, and if you, if you notice this fact, the last time the disciples saw the Lord Jesus, Jesus was blessing them. He had an attitude of blessing toward them with his promises, with his, with his presence. And now they're going to be 10 days without him until the Holy Spirit arrives. When he comes the next time, though, he will come in judgment upon the world. He'll not come in judgment for the church. He will come in blessing for the church. And we are to look as believers to look with great joy and anticipation that he's coming again. Now, this, this place, this geographical location is significant prophetically. They were in the vicinity of the Garden of Gethsemane. This is where, remember Passion Week, this is where he took aside time to pray. This is where he agonized in prayer to the point of droplets of blood. This is where they went after the Last Supper. This is where he came and wrestled knowing that he would be the one to bear the sins of the world on the cross. This was the place where they came and arrested him. This is the place where Peter pulled out his sword and cut off Malchus's ear. This was the same place that Jesus healed that servant's ear. It was there that he took them to see them for the very last time. The Mount of Olives. And if you don't know this, this is the place he would return. We read that in the scripture reading of Acts chapter 1. As you've seen him leave, he will return in like manner. But Zechariah 14.4 predicts that. This is what Zechariah 14.4 says, essentially. It says he'll come back the second time on the Mount of Olives. So let me just read that for you. Zechariah 14.4, this, this, this hill on the side of Jerusalem. Zechariah 14.4 says... And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. And half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And a few verses to to the end of verse 5. And the Lord my God shall come in all the saints with thee. Jesus is coming again, and when he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives, there will be an earthquake, and the mountain shall split in two. He wants to remind them, this is the place where I will come again, and the world will know. Every eye shall see, they'll know who is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. So he led them out here intentionally in regards to that prophecy and in regards to what the angel would say, as you've seen him leave, he will come again. That very same place. And when he sets foot on the Mount of Olives, the world will shake. He's coming again. And the angels told the disciples that, and they're excited about that. Now look back at verse 51 of Luke 24 here. It says, And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. These are the particulars here. After the blessing of the apostles, Jesus ascends into heaven. And so he's blessing them. 
Uh, He's carried up in a cloud into heaven. By the way, if you don't know, the book of Acts, sometimes it's called the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Um, The book of Acts is actually Luke 2, the sequel. Okay, just so you understand. And that's why the story from Acts chapter uh, chapter 1, we see that the angels, what he said there, right, when they asked him the question, shall the kingdom be received? And he said, you know what? You do what I say. Uh, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay, you just wait here in Jerusalem for the next 10 days. The Holy Spirit's going to come, and things are going to change. You will now have the power to witness to me. And so they, he, he, they worshiped him. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Uh, they, they worship him in the strictest sense of, of the word. They, they're, they're adoring him. They're rejoicing. They do what they're instructed, right? But, you know, they watch him. They gaze as, the, as he rises into the heavens, and then two shining ones, two, two angels tell him, tell him, look, he's coming again in like manner. So they're excited. If you were to read Acts 1.11, these two angels... Almost as a matter of factly, look, he's coming again. You know, the gospel writer Luke says here, look, he, he, without, without much fanfare or description, he ascends. <laughs> you know, that doesn't happen, right? They play that, that aspect down. But here, this is a big deal. The ascension has many implications. Why he rose and what happens but here, they're told, look, he's going to come again just as you've seen him arise. He is going to return on the Mount of Olives. And they, that, they're joyful, right? They return to Jerusalem, not with disappointment that he's gone or he's removed. They didn't have a feeling of abandonment. They knew, you know, for 40 days, I wonder what he taught them. There's no doubt in my mind that he taught them about the, the continued uh, Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah, First, he would come as a suffering savior, and then he would come as a conquering king. And so that's why they asked him in Acts chapter 1 at that last conversation on the Mount of Olives, will you again restore the kingdom to Israel? Right? And so they are expecting a returning and a conquering king. They have the the gaps in their knowledge about who Jesus is, why he had to suffer and die and rise again, that they themselves were to go forth and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And so they, they, they have an understanding. Jesus, five different ways, tells them, you're going to go out. Your purpose is to make and mature disciples. He says it in John chapter 20. He says it in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, right? Repentance should be preached in his name. So here are the next 10 days. They are spending time in the temple praising and blessing God. And again, this is a proper response to the reality of the resurrection. Okay, no one just rises from the dead. He is resurrected, and now he is ascended. He is risen, not only physically from the grave, not only physically from the earth, but positionally. His status, where is he? After 40 days of teaching, he tells them to wait in Jerusalem. If you remember, Luke's gospel opened up with devoted believers at the temple praying for the long-expected Messiah. The long-for Messiah should appear. That's what they were expecting. And it closes at the same place. Devoted believers in a place, in a position of worship. That's where we should be all the time. In our hearts, if not physically. In a place of worship and adoration to the Lord our God. So we have in here these verses that they indicate that the book of Acts is a continuation of Luke. But here we see that his ascension, Jesus' is rising into heaven, being lifted or carried up in a cloud, is the completion of his salvation work. There is nothing more to be done. His life and his sacrifice accepted by God, and the proof of that was that he rose from the dead, his resurrection. There's nothing more to do to provide any aspect of salvation. In fact, Jesus summed it up with his work on the earth when he said it on the cross with three words, it is finished. So no more salvation work that needs to be done on the human level. 
All we have to do is trust and believe what he did on the cross, that he himself took my place. Instead of me suffering hell, he died for me. He was buried and that he rose again. And when a sinner repents, to repent means to change your mind so much so that it's radical because my life is no longer going my own direction but going in his way. And for modern perspective, we'd call it, I am now under new management. He is Lord and Savior. So the work of redemption is done. Jesus has ascended. But what is the implication of the ascension here? What does it mean that he left his followers, his apostles? If you look at Mark 16, 19, we see that Jesus has been exalted. And listen, listen to the place where he's been lifted up to. In Mark 16, 19, a parallel passage, it says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up unto heaven, and he sat on the right hand of God. 1 Peter 3, 22. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Okay, this is not a new place for him. In fact, in the high priestly prayer of John 17, 5, he says this, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had before the world was. Bring me back to the same place that I was, the right hand of God, the creator of heaven and earth. Listen, there is no higher place and no closer place to God the Father than to be at the right hand of God. There is no closer place where there could be a mediator to bring me and you to him than at the right hand of God. And it is from there, at the right hand of God, that he serves as a high priest and as an advocate. We see here that Jesus ministers in heaven as a high priest and advocate. What does he do as a high priest? What does he do as an advocate? Okay, he's not dead, he's alive, and he's doing something. Look at Romans 8.34. It's in your outline, I believe. If not, you can just listen. Romans 8.34, the Apostle Paul writes, Who is he that condemns or condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. He is interceding. He is praying on our behalf. He is pleading for us that we would be in God's will. He is pleading for us that we would know who we are and live uprightly. He's praying for us to stand against the world. He's praying for us to do the Great Commission. So it is there. If you read Hebrews 4.14, let me read it to you. It says, Seeing then we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, so he's not on earth, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. The picture there is that he became a man. He understands exactly what it means to be human and to be tempted. So he knows exactly our condition. It goes on to say, But was in all points tempted like as we are, So in every way, he's been tested and tempted by the eyes of the flesh, right? Right? The pride of life. In every way, he understands what it means to be tempted to sin, and yet he's without sin. He's a perfect sacrifice and substitute. Verse 16 of Hebrews 4, Let us therefore... Come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Look, as an intercessor, as someone who stands as a mediator between God and men, we can go boldly to the throne room of grace, to the very presence of God. Why? So that we might obtain grace and mercy to help in time of need. We don't need a middleman. We don't need a priest, we don't need a pastor, we don't need a preacher, we don't need a Sunday school teacher. You and I can go directly to God, boldly to God. So he acts as the mediator between God and man. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 says this, which we have as an anchor of the soul, 
both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. The picture there is that in the temple in heaven, Jesus is there ministering in our behalf. In Hebrews 7.25, it says, Wherefore is he is able to save them to the uttermost that comes unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus is alive, and he's still ministering. And he's ministering, remember, at the right hand of God. He's going to the right place. He is at the right place that we might have access to the throne room of God. And as an advocate, we read in 1 John 2, 1, he says this, the apostle, he says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we see in heaven today, Jesus ministers as our high priest and as our advocate. And as high priest, he gives us grace that we need to face the, temp the temptations and the testings of our life. And as an advocate, when we fail, when we fall, when we mess up, which is guaranteed, we'll fall, we'll say the wrong thing, we'll do the wrong thing. But hopefully as you grow, you'll do that less and less. <laughs> That's what we call maturity and spiritual things. We'll sin less and less. We're not sinless. But as I walk with God, as I mature, as he shows in me the light of his word and my understanding of my place in that, I sin less and less. Not that I'm perfect. Not that I'm sinless. But because he's my advocate, because he's my high priest, I grow and I sin less by his power. So he is in an exalted place. He ministers as the high priest and advocate. And he, he has sent, a, thirdly, because of the ascension, he has sent us his Holy Spirit, one exactly like him. John 16, 7. Jesus says this before he left the earth. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient. It's convenient. It's good for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So because of his ascension, he can now be present with all believers everywhere. In his physical body, he was contained at one locale, one time, one place, with just this group of people. But now, because he has ascended he sent us his spirit. He is no longer limited by a physical body. The Holy Spirit of Christ is present within all believers. Right? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which dwells in you? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Yes, every believer has the Holy Spirit within. The Holy Spirit of Christ. He gave us his spirit, and therefore he gave us his power. He supplies power to his people. That's why we read in Acts 1-8 this morning, he tells them to stay and remain in Jerusalem, and he says this, but you shall receive dunamis, dynamite power, dynamic power. The dynamic power to live a life that is well-pleasing to God. The dynamic power to say, yes, I stand with Jesus Christ, and no matter what the government says, no matter what any official says, I stand with Jesus Christ, and I'm willing to die for it, because those apostles did too. You have power, he says. You'll receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you. You should be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the other most parts of the earth. And in John 14, 12, he says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he, do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So because he has ascended now, you have the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit in your life is not to do miracles, not to feed thousands with three loaves, or two, five loaves and two fish. The miracle is the changing of life through the salvation of the lost by your worship of God first, and then your witness. That's the pattern here. They worshiped, and then they witnessed. They received the power of God to witness to the entire world. Some of you, you're scared in your boots when you talk, when, when, when you talk about your Christian faith. Your knees buckle. But let me tell you, 
All you have to do is obey. All you have to do is to share your life. Remember what a witness does? A witness tells somebody what, is he, what he's experienced. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Okay? A witness shares his experience about the true, the true Jesus who has saved their souls. So he gives us power. He sends us his spirit. He ministers as high priest and advocate. He is exalted at the right hand of God. He's glorified as the head of the church. We could go into it a a lot more deeply from Ephesians chapter 4. He has given gifts unto men. He's given a gift to every believer to minister within the church body, to be a part of the body. In fact, the body is not whole until you do your part in it, essentially, to serve, to exercise your spiritual giftedness. He's given that at least one to every believer that you ought to serve with. So let me close here with this last illustration here. Back, back in 2003 at an Easter service, a woman approached a pastor and she, and she asked him this. So what happened with Jesus after the resurrection, after he rose again? Well, he ascended into heaven and he's still alive, the pastor said. I know he was resurrected, but, he's, but is he really alive? Yes, he's alive, the pastor says. Alive? Alive? Why didn't you tell me? So for the next two weeks, she telephoned everyone she knew and exclaimed, Jesus is alive. Did you know he's alive? That's in every sermon in the New Testament after the ascension. He rose again and he's alive. And every apostle was willing to die for that message. So as we wrap up our reflection here on the Gospel of Luke, Let me just reread uh, the last two verses again and just point out some things on a personal and practical level. It says in Acts 20, I mean, Luke Luke 24, 52, and they worshiped him and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So you see here, do you remember what happened right after the crucifixion? Apostles ran, believers discouraged, down. But here in the last two verses of Luke, they're no longer discouraged, they're no longer depressed, they're no longer down, they're not in a dark room afraid anymore, right? They're no longer confused about his role as a suffering savior. They fully understand how the Old Testament predicted that this would happen. I think Jesus taught more about the suffering Savior and the prophecies, and and then he also taught more about the second coming. That's why they asked, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? I think he taught them about his second coming as a conquering king. And so here, these disciples are no longer discouraged. They've seen the resurrected Christ. They have watched as he has ascended unto heaven to stand or to sit at the right hand of the Lord Most High. So they knew they were not abandoned. They know from his exalted position at the right hand of the Father that he would send his spirit like he said he would through the ever-present indwelling Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, his presence would be mediated to his people. Jesus said in John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you parentless or I will not leave you as an orphan. Right, I will come to you. And so he comes to every believer in the person of the Holy Spirit. The ascension means not only that Jesus has been exalted on high, but it also means that he's able to draw near in an intimate fellowship through the Spirit. Let me just give you that last contrast or comparison here. Okay? It seems, this dichotomy, it just seems opposite. If he's ascended, that means he's far away. Right? But if he's near, it means he's close. So how do I reconcile those two truths? Well, the ascent, number one, the Lord, the ascended Lord draws near. That is, 
he comes alongside us by the Holy Spirit of God. Though he's always present with us, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Sometimes we experience his closeness more than other times. I don't want to get too weird about this or mystical about it. But sometimes we feel his presence greater and it's obvious. I thought about that. I shared this with somebody within the last week or two. Um, the process of me coming here. Okay, long story short, I was conversing with uh, Pastor Philippi. I had candidated at least at one other place. Um, was looking at different places as well. Uh, Pastor Philippi talked about a, a position opening here, and I didn't know about it, right? But long story short, I had been praying for this church for about a year before I knew that a position was open. After Pastor Philippi said, I said, where, where is this church? And he said, oh, it's Berea Baptist Church in Palm Harbor, Florida. And so I hung up the phone. I Googled it, right? I'm like, I was praying for this church for a year already, and I didn't even know. I hung up, and my next phone call was to my father-in-law, and I said, I'm going here. There is no doubt in my mind, no matter what happens, <laughs> I am going here. And you know what? His presence was more real, more obvious. It was so real that he might as well have been right in front of me physically, though I know he won't do that until he returns again in power and great glory, and he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives. But I knew that nearness through the Holy Spirit of Christ, every believer has the privilege to feel and to experience. He's answered prayer in an unexpected way. I know he's there. I know he's real. He reminds me that he provides. He reminds me that he protects. He makes it clear to me, right? I don't have a rushing sound of a mighty wind. I don't have a, a loud noise. I don't have a bright light showing upon in my life. I don't have shining ones or angels telling me that he's alive and well. I just know by experience that he's there and he's real. He's ascended, but he's present. So do you remember a time in your past when you've experienced that? Perhaps when you, everything was bleak, you were cornered. You've looked everywhere for help, and the only place you could look up next was up. When you had more questions than answers, when your circumstances were gigantic and you felt smaller than an ant, when it was night and it seemed like the dawn would never come, and then he comes alongside you. Be still. Know that I'm God. He draws to us. He draws near to us. And because he is ascended, because of his ascension, our hearts are calmed, our panic subsides and our fears are relieved. He draws near to us in our lowest state. But then the, the, the dichotomy, the, other, the opposite side, not only is he near me, but he's ascended and he's seated at the right hand of God on high. Ephesians 1 says he's far above all rule and authority. There's no power greater than his. There's no authority greater than his. He has power and dominion in every name that is named. He has ruled over them. He's our great high priest. He makes intercession for us. We have an awesome Savior who is seated at the right hand of God. That should be such an awesome sight, an awesome knowledge that no one can do us any harm because he is at the right hand of God. We have a glorious high priest. He's the eternal mediator. He, he lives by the power of an endless life. We can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace and we can receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because of his ascension, our hearts are calmed, our panic subsides, and our fears are relieved. We draw near to him 
in the heavenlies. I can't explain it. It's metaphysical. He draws near to us, and we draw near to him, and we are seated in heaven with him. There is no greater place of safety and provision than in the perfect will of God. So let's bow here. If you would bow with me as we close. I'm going to ask the pianist just to play lightly. Some of you here are perhaps going through a situation. You're going through the long and the dark night of the soul. Physically, you're being tested. You're being tried. Financially, you are worried. You don't know where to look. You don't know where to put your finances. You don't know, even know how to pay your next bill. Can I tell you that Jesus Christ is near and he is interceding for you? Can I tell you that Jesus Christ is ascended? He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. There is no higher authority or power than he himself. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the worry, whatever the care, he says, cast your care upon me because I care for you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I am struggling. Pray for me. Raise your hand. Pastor, I am struggling. I don't know. I see that hand in the back. Anybody else? I don't know where my next, yes, I see your hand. I don't know where my next check is coming from. I don't know what my future holds, but praise God, I know who holds it. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for Luke's good news that we have a savior and a champion and his name is Jesus and he's ascended to the right hand of the father on high and that he is also very very near who speaks who calms who alleviates my anxiety and calms all my fears we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us. Help us to obey. Help us to accept the power of the Spirit of God in our lives to do what is necessary, to do what you've told us to do. Thank you for that power and that presence of the Holy Spirit. We ask for a greater ministry of your Spirit in each life to worship you with all our hearts, souls, and mind in strength and then to witness for you in a nation that seems to be growing darker and darker every day. Help us to shine forth as lights in the world, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for being such good and careful listeners this morning. Let me just remind you that the, the low-key low key men's ensemble music ministry will be here tonight at 5.30 p.m. If you plan on attending, please uh, sign the, the sign-up sheet that's in the back of the auditorium. And if you do come, please uh, bring a side dish. The church will provide for the pizza. And then uh, just a reminder, your 2020 giving statements are on the back table. The 2021 memory verse cards are available on the back table as well. And don't forget uh, your 2021 tithing and giving envelopes are in, uh, in the back table as well. Let's do our part. And uh, let's continue to be prayerful for our nation, for us as Christians that we would stand as we should. So please stand with me and we'll close in the last song.
us. God bless you. We'll see you tonight.